Um, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And really, we're just getting started on that. It's the longest recorded teaching by Jesus. And um, when we introduced it a, a couple weeks ago, uh, we, we set the context that Jesus gave this sermon at, towards the beginning of his ministry. And uh, the Gospel of Luke also records Jesus teaching about many of the same topics, but they're set in different contexts and in, uh, at different times. So that tells us that the Sermon on the Mount included uh, a bunch of topics that Jesus felt was worth repeating. So we should take a little mental note that Jesus is saying this more than once. Maybe, maybe it's something that's important. We should pick up on this. And uh, one of those ideas that Jesus spoke about many times was the idea of light, uh, using light as a word picture for us. And that's our topic this morning. So let's look at our main passage. It's Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. Um, I've got the, the old NIV version. Uh, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand so it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. <coughs> so what does it mean to be the light of the world? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Uh, most of us with at least some church background at least get the, the gist of his meaning uh, but this morning we're going to look at what it means specifically and biblically uh, to be the light of the world. And I found a lot of passages on light, like a lot more than I was expecting to find. And uh, sorted through all that, and four common ideas seem to surface about Jesus' illustration of light. And uh, I'm going to give you the whole picture in one sentence, and then we're going to step back and break it down into pieces. So being the light of the world means bringing others to the true light, using both deeds and words, despite opposition, and with loving urgency. I'll say that again. Being the light of the world means bringing others to the true light, using both deeds and words, despite opposition, and with loving urgency. So let's uh, break that down into parts. So being the light of the world uh, number one means bringing others to the true light. Bringing others to the true light. Ecclesiastes 11.7 says, Light is sweet, and it's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. And I, we, we've got the sun shining this morning. I, I can definitely relate to that. Uh, that seasonal disorder where you tend to get down and depressed when you haven't had enough exposure to sunlight like all winter in Michigan, uh, that affects me. And uh, so I agree that light is sweet and it's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So uh, it's a great metaphor that Jesus uses for us to introduce the idea of witnessing evangelism, uh, intentional outreach, sharing the love of Jesus, however you want to say it. Uh, that's what being the light of the world is talking about. And, of course, the true light is referring to Jesus. The true light is Jesus. If you've got a Bible with you uh, on your phone or a uh, book form, uh, you can turn to John. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 1, a, a few verses there. Uh, John 1, verses 4 through 9. Uh, John 1, starting at verse 4, says, In him talking about the word, which was referring to Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And by the way, that's referring to John the Baptist, not John the Apostle who wrote the book of John. Uh, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Then uh, several chapters later, uh, in John 8, 12, uh, it says, uh, again, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus uh, is, is the light. Um, and there are many more passages that connect Jesus with the idea of light. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, Jesus in his glorified state. Um, talks about him dwelling in unapproachable light, covering himself with light as a garment, having his face shine like the sun, having a rainbow aura, being the literal light of the recreated earth, the heavens and earth, the new heaven and new earth, so that there won't be any need for a sun or stars or lamps because Jesus is the actual light. Um, so Jesus is the true light, and we are the light of the world when we're witnesses to the true light. We're the light of the world when we're witnesses to the true light. Uh, when, the Apollo, when the Apostle Paul uh, changed from being a persecutor of Christians to becoming one. Um, if you're familiar with that story, it's kind of funny how Jesus got his attention. He, he blasted him with a spotlight from heaven that knocked him off his horse and blinded him. And uh, then this is what Jesus said to him. When Paul recounts this story later on uh, in Acts 26, verses 16 through 18. Acts 26, 16 through 18. Um, Jesus said to him, uh, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness to what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So being the light of the world is about rescuing people from the darkness, bringing them into the light. It's about sharing the good news of Jesus' offer uh, to forgive and, and to adopt us and restore us. Um, we hear this, and we might, some of us might tend to think, yeah, but, you know, as a Christian, am I, am I really supposed to evangelize? I mean, that's not my spiritual gift. And, you know, I... I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody to call me a proselytizer. Uh, I don't want to lose any friendships over it. Well, yes, we really are supposed to evangelize. Uh, and that's for all Christians, not just those with the specific spiritual gift of that. And when we drag our feet about witnessing, uh, it's exactly like hiding our light under a bowl instead of letting it shine. Here's another instance when Jesus taught the same concept in, in Luke 8:16. It says, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. So we've had a light going this morning. It's not like super dramatic because it's so bright outside, but there's a light hidden right in front of us. So we're going to put it on a stand instead. We have to remember, like, when we come across those fears of talking to people about Jesus, we have to remember that uh, we're talking about the, the gospel is called good news for a reason. And, and it's talking about light that's sweet and pleasant. Um, it's all good. And, and if we witness the right way, it brings joy. So what is the right way to witness uh, that's the, the second piece of it. Uh, the second point is um, using both deeds and words. Uh, using both deeds and words. Um, let me share what the wrong way to witness is. Uh, the wrong way is to make people projects where your primary goal is to convert them. Uh, the wrong way is to point a condemning finger at people. Uh, the wrong way is to use gimmicks, fast talk, uh, sales pitches, or scare tactics. Uh, I'd like to share a few paragraphs from this book. It's uh, Living the Gospel in the Gray, the Art of Coming Alongside. It was written by the lead campus minister at Purdue's Christian Campus House. I like Purdue's version of his house. And the, the first page of, of, of uh, chapter one says this. After worship one Sunday, two of our male students burst into my office, barely able to contain their excitement. 
Just the night before, they had been at a party and had struck up a conversation with a girl who obviously needed to talk. Reluctant at first, she revealed that she finally revealed that she was going through a rough time and was dealing with a lot of brokenness. While the music blared in the other room, the guys shared the gospel message with her, and it was life a life-changing experience. Through her tears, she prayed to receive Christ, and they left the party elated that God had used them to lead this girl to the Lord. Later that week, one of our female students burst into my office, barely able to contain her frustration. She was livid as she shared how her roommate had been, in her words, accosted by two Christian guys at a party. They had been determined to convert her, but it only proceeded to confuse and upset her to the point of tears. She had finally agreed to pray a sinner's prayer, their words, but from the perspective of the girl, it was more of a prayer of, I'll say this to get you off my back, than a prayer of repentance to receive salvation. The story gets even more tragic. In the weeks leading up to the party, the girl had been opening up to her Christian roommate, having honest conversations and asking thoughtful questions about faith in God and life. After this experience, however, she made it clear that she wanted nothing to do with Christianity or the late night talks. I hate that story. The two guys weren't being jerks. They are two of the most on fire, sincere followers of Christ that I know of. But on this particular night, their zeal for evangelism got in the way of their ability to actually share the gospel. In the midst of trying to save the girl, they missed the girl. In a very real sense, it became more about them than about her. So, um, these guys had words, but they had no deeds. They had no example to this girl that they had just met. And uh, our, our goal has to be, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, it says that they may see our good deeds and praise the Father in heaven. So it has to be, our goal has to be about them praising God, not about us converting them when we're sharing with people. Uh, in our theme passage, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Uh, so Jesus says being the light involves our good deeds, uh, but it also has to involve our words. It has to be both, not one or the other. If we have words without action, people aren't going to listen to the words. If we have words without action, people aren't going to listen to the words. And if we have action without words, people cannot possibly know how to accept Jesus. If we have all action but no words, people cannot possibly know how to accept Jesus. Now, if someone sees that you're kind, and you're humble, and you're generous, and pure, and loving, and helpful, that is a great testimony. But th that does not automatically translate into, uh, this is our predicament before God because we chose wrong. This is the sacrifice Jesus did in his love to restore us. And this is how to accept this only way that God offers to save us. No one can know that without using words. That has to be communicated through words. Uh, 1 Peter 2, um, verse 9 and verse 12. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 12. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak evil against you, as speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So even if they're trying to accuse you, your good deeds are going to speak for themselves. But we we need to both live it and proclaim it. So loving people through good deeds is what earns you a voice in their life. But when we let other people know that we're Christians, um, our lives have to be in line with God, or else uh, our words are going to do the opposite of witnessing. Uh, there's no greater turnoff to God than hypocrisy. But here's a word picture of what the lives of the children of light should look like. Uh, 
Proverbs 4, verse 18 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Um, For anyone who's clearly accepted Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to live for him, to follow God's instructions. Uh, We just need to be willing to cooperate and participate with the Holy Spirit. We, we have the ability. doesn't mean it's automatic, though. We, we have to be willing participants. And as we get in line with God and with, with His Spirit, the more He's going to give us ability and the more He's going to give us opportunity. So our light will shine brighter and brighter over time as we get in line with Him. And that brings us to the next point. Uh, the reason it's often hard to live out God's instructions is because of spiritual warfare. Um, So being the light of the world means shining despite opposition. We need to shine despite opposition. Uh, Look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's a little insight into that opposition to the light. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 through 6. Even if our goal is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God. For, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, Later on in that book, in in chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, it says, No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It's no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Uh, So a little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus brings up light again. Um, and I'm going to tie that in here instead of waiting till we get to it in the series. In Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This is one of the more obscure lines in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I think we we try to complicate it a little bit more than we need to. Uh, it seems uh, to relate to the other two passages that we just read. They're talking about spiritual warfare. Uh, Satan tries to copy the light, and uh, this version, his, his version of the light, is a forgery. It, it, it's a fraud. And the eye being the lamp of the body is basically talking about how we need to see the world. So if Satan taints someone's worldview, if they buy into his his deception, uh, that that person's going to think they're looking at the world in the right way, um, but in reality they're living in darkness. Uh, if their spiritual eye, their worldview, is unhealthy. How great is that darkness, and they don't even know it. Um, you know, maybe it's someone who wants nothing to do with God. Maybe it's someone who even grew up in the church. But we still have to have God's worldview. We have to have healthy spiritual eyes to see the light and be in tune with it. And, and that's why we have to be the light in love, uh, because that's the only way to be effective against the opposition. Um, Kelsey's been showing some documentaries of God's power and love. And uh, in one of those videos, the the second one that we watched, I think it was called Furious Love, um, the documentary team had clearly seen God's miraculous power work through them to heal people and and bring people, draw people to Jesus. And uh, so they're like, man, God is awesome. And so they brought their camera crew to a witchcraft festival to basically pick a fight and say, look how amazing the real God is. And um, 
But the Holy Spirit refused to do anything while they were there. Uh, he, he wouldn't do anything miraculous. He wouldn't draw anybody to them. Um, wouldn't move in anyone's heart until they corrected their focus to be loving and got out of the way of their own spotlight. Uh, and then God did start to draw people towards himself, even in the midst of a witchcraft festival. Um, so don't hide your light uh, in fear of that opposition, and in fear of rejection, in fear of those who have that darkened worldview. Uh, and neither should we go picking a fight with the enemy. Uh, it has to be that balance between, you know, we, we don't want to hide the light and we don't want to blast everybody with it either. And, and that brings us to the last piece. Uh, being the light of the world means shining with loving urgency. Shining with loving urgency. Uh, in Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables in a row about lost things. Uh, there is the lost sheep, the lost, co the lost coin, and then the lost son, which most people know as the prodigal son. Now listen to his imagery about the lost coin uh, in Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. Luke 15, 8 through 10. It says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Uh, in, in Jesus' story, there, there was a valuable coin that was lost. And it wasn't like a penny or something. It was, it was probably a day's wage. Um, also, uh, Ten coins were, were sometimes given as a wedding gift, so there was sentimental value to this coin as well as just the monetary value. Um, and when the coin was lost, the lamp, a lamp was lit to search carefully. So uh, the woman in the story didn't just wait around and hope the coin would turn up sometime. She, she was intentional. She was proactive. She was urgent because the coin was valuable to her. So likewise, we should proactively use our light to search for what is lost. We should proactively use our light to search for what is lost. And don't just assume it will all pan out for the people in your circle of influence. Um, there's much rejoicing whenever uh, a lost person is found spiritually. And we need to let our light shine intentionally. And I don't like scare tactics in witnessing. Um, there is truth to the fact that we don't know how long somebody has. Um, that friend or family member who seems like the picture of health could develop a, a terminal disease over a few months. Um, they, they could be hit by a car today. Um, or, or due to jobs or schooling, they might only be in your life for a very short season. And regardless of all this, at some point, Jesus is going to come back and call time up on the world. So, a couple more passages. First uh, Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 2. First Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 2. It says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the, in the night. Then skipping to verse 4. Uh, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet of the hope of salvation. Uh, similarly, Paul says uh, in another place, in Romans 13, verses 11 and 12. Romans 13, 11 and 12. Uh, Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, 
for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. So he used kind of the arm of God that a lot of us know from Ephesians 6, he kind of used it in, in context of, of armor of light here. So the light of the world in general, we need to wake up, um, be intentional. We need to live live lives as children of light with urgency. Uh, we need to shine our light by showing and proclaiming um, our faith in love, but on this battlefield. We need to actively search for the lost and draw them to Jesus' light. So the bottom line is, will I step up and be the light in my corner of the world? Will I step up and be the light in my corner of the world? And uh, if anyone's unsure if they've ever uh, clearly responded to Jesus and accepted his offer, um, or if, if you know you have, but you don't really know it well enough to articulate to others and would like some training in that, um, come talk with me. Uh, either we're, we're doing the last couple songs or uh, afterwards, and uh, we want to help you be able to, to share your light with others. So let me pray.